Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come. Will you please rise as we sing our first hymn this morning, He Keeps Me Singing. Please bow with me. Dear most wonderful Father and God, your name is holy. In the beginning, your spirit moved upon the face of the waters. Out of chaos, you created everything. You had only simply to speak into existence everything, and everything obeyed your command. You formed man from the dust and breathed your spirit into him. You caused Adam to sleep, and from his side you created woman. You created the garden, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the expanding universe, the earth, and all that is on it that we stand on and live upon you created. And when you looked after you had created, you said that all things were good. Sin crept into your creation and made things that were once good into things that are now ugly. We stand before you responsible for the sin we brought into this world. Yet you sent your son to remove that sin from us and carry it upon himself. Jesus' death on the cross should have brought all things back to being good. But you, your creation, broadly and boldly worship the creation rather than the creator. We stand before you this morning to worship you, to beg your forgiveness. Truly, we proclaim you as our Father and our God, Jesus as our Lord and King. We look forward to the day you send Jesus to claim us and pray that day comes soon. For as we look around us 
it is hard to see and impossible to say that everything or anything is good. Be with us this morning and accept our humble worship. Fill this place with your holy presence as we, your children, pray to be closer to you and feel your presence in and around us. Help us to learn something this morning so that we may be the children of your desire. We come to you in the name of our precious Lord and Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated as Jesus carries me. Lord, you search me. do carry me. Our psalm this morning, uh, our responsive reading from Psalms 105, 1 through 3. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on him. Sing to him. Make music to praise him. Brag about his holy name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Meditate on all the miracles he has performed. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Amen. Our memory verse, again from Psalms 104.34, May my thoughts be pleasing to him, that's the Lord. I will find joy in the Lord. Psalm 104.34, our last, our last week for that. So I hope that you have that permanently implanted in your mind and in your heart 
my thought, may my thoughts be pleasing to him. I will find joy in the Lord. May my thoughts be pleasing to him. I will find joy in the Lord. Psalms 104, 34. Okay, kids, let's get on your dancing shoes, your jumping shoes, your ears perked up and in front of the TV. Parents, get the kids out here. Hill songs, Jesus in my life. As it says in Philippians 4, verse 7, that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guide your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Don't you just love the promises of God? And that's my prayer for you, is that you will have Jesus in your life. I hope you kids take him to school with you every day. I hope your parents take them to work every day. I hope that you find a song that will buzz around in your, your head that will keep you close to the Lord. Good morning. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. I, If you hear me sniffling, whatever, I'm a little under the weather this morning, but uh, uh, we're going to, we're, we're thankful to, to be here, and uh, I'm thankful to be uh, serving my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I hope you are too. 
Uh, remember that next week we'll have communion, so uh, please uh, think about this this week and the things that may stand in the way between you and the Lord, you know, get those out of the way as well. So, um, Polly gets that back. There we go. Uh, our telephone number here, 814-967-3628. Please call me or write me if you need counseling or, or want to set up an appointment for counseling or, or, or you need prayer, please give me a call. Uh, Bible study that Wednesday nights at 7, and uh, we want to let you know that we're on the radio, 97.9, on the WUZZ network uh, at 8.30 Sunday mornings and at uh, uh, 10.30 out of Talk Erie. Uh, uh, that's uh, 105.9. And then... Uh, uh, 7 p.m. Sunday evenings, uh, we're, where you're watching us on Armstrong Cable, also Wednesday mornings at 9 o'clock Wednesday mornings as well. So, a lot of stuff going on in the world, and it's, it's amazing the, the things that are, that are happening around us. There's so many things that are going on around us that we can reference in the Bible as, as the Lord Jesus Christ and, and prophets of the Old Testament telling us to be careful of, to watch over, to, to know those signs uh, uh, that, that they are coming. One of the things that Micah tries to teach us through this is that God makes it clear that as the nation of Israel moved farther and farther, and I believe that that has to do with us as well, because a lot of people think that we're different, we've escaped, but I think that the Lord saved the United States to be a Christian nation, because certainly we were founded as a Christian nation. I don't know why we apologize so much for that these days. It's, a, it's a, amazing to me. I think we should be proud to be a Christian nation, but we are moving and have been moving farther and farther away from what God would consider to to be appropriate, to be reasonable, rational. I, um, I think that uh, I just discovered that 70% of evangelicals don't vote, which is amazing to, to me that we live in a country where we have a say and we don't want to have a say, where we want to have the government to fall back on. I, I guess maybe we think that we can just tell God that oh, I'm free from, from those things that, that the government did. But I know we should be praying for all of those who um, are suffering through the, the hurricane uh, uh, that came up uh, through the Gulf. Uh, What's it been, 146 years or so since one came up on that side of uh, Florida and uh, hit Tallah Tallahassee and Perth. I've been in Perth many, many times. I used to ride my bicycle when I was in seminary over over there and then down the, down the close, uh, coast a little bit to the uh, 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 Cedar Keys and, and down that way. And it's amazing. Uh, uh, that so much has changed in there as a result of this. But the first thing that I'm hearing from people is about it being global warming. Oh, we want to blame global warming. We want to blame global warming. But in the scripture, God makes it clear that these kind of things that happen incrementally are going to get worse and worse and worse. And there, by his hand, trying to bring us back to him. We, as a society, want to blame something other than God, something other than ourselves. We want to make it about global warming. It might as well be about ball worship. It could be an Aztec and run up more people up on top of the temple and cut their hearts out to send messages. 
the things that are going on in the world today, whether they be in Israel or Ukraine or South Florida and up through the Ohio Valley now with all the rain. We don't need them in the world if we would just understand that Yahweh, Jehovah, is our God and Jesus Christ is our Lord and we would take him into our lives. If you have prayer requests this morning, I ask you to lift them up to the Lord. He knows what your prayer requests are, what your needs are, what we all need in our communities. I want you to continue to pray for Mary and, and Nora and Miriam and, and Mary Ann and, and um, all the things that are going on here as we continue to, to work and struggle to reach people. We're really struggling to build this church to try to make it be the, the place that, that God needs it to be in this community, the place that reaches out to, to our young people and, and, and to you to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep us close with the Lord. We need that in these days. I am really heartened to find out that Alabama, Arkansas, a couple of the universities in the South, that they're having large gatherings of, of young people listening and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think we get too busy. Sometimes our kids get into school and I think that's not cool. But I think the coolest people at all, if you go back and, and you witnessed the videos of, of the kids at, at, uh, in Alabama and Arkansas and other places, that uh, Bowling Green, other places that uh, have had revivals on campus. I think they're the coolest people of them all. I want you to be one of those too. Come and know the Lord Jesus Christ. Come worship with us. Come help us build, rebuild our youth group and rebuild the, our sanctuary and, and our congregation. And we need you. I need people to, to help me do the things that we need to do here to reach into this community for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not for me, but for the Lord. Thy word.
with me in your Old Testament to the book of Micah towards the back of the Old Testament chapter 6 listen the Lord has filed a lawsuit against his people you mortals the Lord has told you what is good this is what the Lord requires from you to do what is right to love mercy and to live humbly with your God the voice of the Lord calls out to the city the fear of your name is wisdom. Listen, you tribe assembled in the cities. I have cursed all the wicked people who use their money for evil and use inaccurate weights and measures. I cannot to tolerate dishonest scales and bags filled with inaccurate weights. The rich people in the city are violent. Those who live in the city speak lies and their tongues speak deceitfully. I have begun to strike you with heavy blows and to ruin you because of your sins. You will eat, but you won't be full. You will always be hungry. You will put things away, but you won't save them. Anything you save, I will destroy. You will plant, but you won't harvest. You will Crush olives, but you won't rub the olive oil on your skin. You will make new wine, but you won't drink it. You have kept Omri's laws and all the practices of the descendants of Ahab, and you have followed their advice. That is why I will ruin you. Your people will be ridiculed. You will bear the disgrace of my people. What the Lord requires is part two, taking this chapter and making two sermons out of it, but there's so much in it. Verse eight is the joy and delight of liberal pastors and ministers around the world because they think that it presents a works religion, that it teaches that man can be saved by his own works. What Micah is doing here really is answering the question of the many sincere people in the northern kingdom of Israel who were in darkness at that time, who had not been taught the word of God. They didn't know anything about it. They wanted to know how to come before God. They wanted to know whether they should bring burnt offerings, whether they should bring many offerings, and whether they should offer even their own children as human sacrifices. Micah answers all of these questions. None of these things does God require. External religion without an internal experience, without reality on the inside, is absolutely valueless. There must be a rebirth, a new nature given to the individuals. Externalities are not important. God never begins there. If you want to know what God takes delight in, what he requires of man, this verse will tell you. I want us to consider this verse very carefully in great detail. Mr. Liberal, I insist that you interpret this accurately. And when you do, you will find that you are not saved by your good works because you don't have any good works. He hath shown thee, O man, what is good. We notice, first of all, that this is addressed to man. This means not only the man in Israel, but also the man in the United States. Not only the person in the 7th century B.C., but also the person of the 21st century A.D. And in 2024, this is for mankind. These are the three things that God requires. You are to do justly. That is, you must have a righteousness to present to God. You must be a righteous person. 
You are to be just in your dealings with your fellow man. You are to be honest and true. Number two, you are to love mercy. You are not only to love the mercy of God, but also to be merciful in your dealings with other people. And three, you are to walk humbly with God. How are you going to do these things? Can you do them in your own strength? Do you think that you can do them without God's help? Do you think that you can do them without God's salvation? If you do, I'm going to say something very strong here. You are a hypocrite. Don't tell me that you live by this moral code without the power of God. You cannot, for the very simple reason that all of these are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. All three of these things which Micah lists are the works of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. None of us has any one of these things in his life today. Let's turn to the New Testament and see what is said there concerning this. Listen to a man who lived under the law. In the 15th chapter of Acts, when the apostles were deciding whether the Gentiles would have to keep the law in order to be saved, Simon Peter stood up and said, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Why did he say that? Because he had just said in Acts 15.10, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Simon Peter said, I lived under the law and I did not measure up to it. God has made it very clear through the words of the Apostle Paul also. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the, after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. And to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, it is hostile, enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. How does the Spirit of God dwell in you? The Lord Jesus said, ye must be born again. You must be born again by receiving Christ Jesus. But as many as received him, to them gave he power, the right, the authority, the exousian power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. In Romans 3, 9 through 18, the Apostle Paul sets before us the condition of man. He brings man before the judgment bar of God and shows that he is guilty. Then Paul makes man into the clinic, takes man into the clinic of God and shows that he is sick, sick nigh unto death. In fact, he is dead in trespasses and sins, says Paul. No man, therefore, whoever he is, can present these things to God. God requires righteousness, but we cannot meet that standard. Paul says there is none righteous, no, not one. Paul, in Romans, is quoting the Old Testament in Psalms 14.1. We find the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. This is what God says about you. But God also says that he requires righteousness. How are you going to be able to present it to him? Paul goes on 
to say in Romans 3.11, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. In other words, there is none that acts even on the knowledge that he has. Do you, if you are not a Christian, really live up to the to your ideal standard? Have you attained the goals that you have set? Have you come to a plateau in your life where you are satisfied with your living? May I say to you, none of us even act on the knowledge which we have. There is none that seeketh after God. Again, this idea is found in the Old Testament in Psalms 14, 3, 2 and 3. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They were all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. I could multiply from the Old Testament such statements again and again and again. Righteousness is what God requires. But the Old Testament makes it very obvious that we cannot present our righteousness to God because we don't have any righteousness. We were never born with any. We can't acquire any. Since God requires righteousness, there must be a change in the life, our life, because there is none righteous. We are told that Jesus was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The Lord Jesus was raised for our righteousness that we might have righteousness. Here we discover that we have no righteousness. People think that they can earn it, that they can work for it. The liberal wants you to believe that you can develop righteousness by being a good person. But anyone who believes he is righteous is arrogant. It was necessary for Jesus to be raised so that we might have righteousness, that by the Spirit of God, we might produce righteousness in our lives. We don't have the love of mercy in our human hearts either. We are dead in trespasses and sin. Paul says they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. This is the picture of man. This is the way that man is today. The same point is presented to us by Isaiah. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Evidently, us all have iniquity, or Isaiah would not have made a statement like that. Therefore, let us not be hypocritical when we come to this verse in Micah that tells us that we are to walk humbly with our God. None seeketh after God. Instead, we want to come to God in and by our own way. We want to set the conditions for which we will come. We come to make an emotional decision, knowing that it's the right thing, but we want to come our own way. This is my pet peeve with modern religious movements, the seeker-friendly church, the church that preaches to plant seeds to get earthly rewards, the church that teaches that membership will get you to heaven. There is the church of health and wellness, the LGBT religious movement. They all preach that God needs you. And you can come to the throne of God by any way you desire, your own way. Or that you can work your way to heaven. That you do not have to lay anything down. That you don't have to empty yourself. That there needs to be a repentance, but only repentance for the things you wish to repent. God expects us and requires us to come to him 
an empty vessel. We give up who we are. God doesn't empty us. We must empty ourselves, which means that before we come to the cross of Christ, we give up all of us. These movements appear to be that instead of us being one with and one in Christ, we bring Christ into us. Like inviting a friend who just got evicted from his apartment over to our house to stay for a while. We find an empty space and let them settle in. This is wrong-headed because it should be we who are moving out of this world and asking to come into the place of God. We are in, in Christ. Even I have had to make that change in my thinking over, over the year because so many times I've heard that we invite Christ into us and as we grow, we empty and clean the rooms out and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But the reality is we have no righteousness to present to Christ and Scripture tells us that when we are born again, we become one in Christ. We're the guest, not the homeowner. Christ is the homeowner. I think that the religious community has gotten it, gone over the wrong edge when these past years we've preached things about having Christ come into our hearts, as I said. We think it's okay to empty ourselves of just those things that we wish to empty ourselves of, of and to make just enough room for Christ and the Holy Spirit to live in. Like that commercial that I've seen, something about cats where everybody's in this tiny little room. We make just enough room to squeeze them in to our lives. This is a false concept. Since in reality, when we come properly to Christ for real, we wind up in Christ. So somehow, we have to be made to where we can be acceptable to be invited into Christ and find ourselves living in and through Christ. Because the reality, as we really grow in that, we find that God and Christ want to live through us. It is not the other way around. Christ is not in me. I am in Christ. And I get myself in Christ by recognizing that I have nothing in me that is righteous. I have nothing to offer God. So I come to Christ to find his righteousness. I surrender me and put his righteousness on. It is interesting. Christ stands at the door of my heart and knocks, waiting to be let in. But when we let him in, the ultimate goal is to give up the house we live in and accept the invitation to enter into Christ. We must make ourselves acceptable to Christ that we are unrighteous. Not only is not righteous, but also we must understand we have no righteousness of our own to show off or to hold on to. There is no way to obtain righteousness outside of Christ. So those who come to Christ believing they can hold on to some pet personal thing like alcohol, drugs, sex, violence, LB, LGBTQ+, cannot find themselves in Christ, for there is no room for any of those things in Christ. They are not welcome in the bosom of our Lord, nor are they welcome in God's heaven. When I was on the streets of Houston picking up heroin addicts and alcoholics out of the gutters, it was the ones who could see this and could lay everything down. They would, we would pick them up. We would put them in a hotel room that we had uh, in downtown Houston. We would detox them. We would take care of them, clean up the vomit, and, and, and it was terrible at times, really terrible. And some of them could come to the point where they just could give up everything. For some, it was either that or death. I saw several who made the ultimate complete surrender actually find the hand of God and immediately began to be born again. 
new creatures in Christ. They were completely different persons, healed. But the sad reality of life is that many just can't let go of those things here on earth that are earthly that they love. They want to fool us, but they never could. Satan has worked with Christianity and the human heart and spirit a long time, and he knows just how to change the definitions to make it look like salvation when it's a fraud. You cannot be born again and be a child of God in Christ when Satan has you defiantly and arrogantly by some right that holding on to anything other than Christ. You must give it up and come to Christ empty to be in Christ, a new born-again creature, sealed and secured by the hand of God and his Holy Spirit. I want to say this in all kindness, but I trust that it might startle some. If you believe that you, your church membership or your character or your good works are going to get you to God, then may I say that you are bypassing God's way. The Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That is why I can boldly proclaim without hesitation that Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and every other form of religious person is lost and possessed by Satan. Jesus is the only way. No person can be saved except through Christ. If you can get to God without Christ by doing justly, by loving mercy, and by walking humbly with God, and you can do it that on your own, when you get to heaven, you can tell God to move over. You can tell him that you want to share his throne with him, that you got there all by yourself, that you didn't need him since you are your own God. But God says that he does not share his glory with another. And I do not think he will share his throne with you. So why don't you come to God and do it God's way and not your way? Doing justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God are things which God requires. Who are you kidding when you claim that you do these things in your natural state? My, how verses like these, when held up to the human family, show us what we really are like. Some commend themselves for being polite, nice folk, especially on Sundays when they seem so genteel and loving, and yet they have never come to God his way. How can you continue on in a hypocrisy like that? Why not be honest with God? Just come right out with it. Go to him and tell him that you are a sinner. He already knows that you are. Just go to God. Tell him the thing that is wrong with you. Tell him about your hang-ups. Tell him about the sin in your life. Because God wants to save you. God wants to forgive your sins and give you the righteousness of Christ. Having presented to these people what God requires, Micah is going to show them how far they have fallen short of it. The reason that God will judge them is because of their willful and continual sinning. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city. Micah is God's man, and he is crying to the city to wake up, to repent, to turn back to the Lord. And the man of wisdom shall see thy name, hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it. The rod is for judgment. We read in the second psalm, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The rod represents the judgment of God. Judgment is coming upon this nation. The man of wisdom who believes God and who will listen would recognize that judgment was coming upon the nation and would act accordingly. The voice of God is lifted 
and he speaks forth in judgment. The man is a wise man who sees the dealings of God, which reveal his righteous character, as well as the fact that he is long-suffering, patient, and will pardon iniquity. The rod is God's badge of authority as the judge who will judge. There was still sin in the nation, and Micah is now going to reveal these sins. He is going to spell them out. Treasures of wickedness refers to the wealth that they had accumulated in their unjust dealings. Many of these people were coming into the temple bringing a sacrifice, going through the outward ceremony and saying that they were doing just and loving mercy, but what were they doing during the week? God says, shall I count them with the wicked? Balances pure? Businessmen were dishonest in their business deals, he, he, he says, and with the bag of deceitful weights, they were absolutely crooked. They were greedy. They were covetous. They, yet they tried to pass themselves off as religious people. Today, it's the mafia, the professional criminal, the head of families who traffic in drugs, who traffic in human flesh, who spend, send People out to steal women and children to place in a sex slave business. In many other parts of the world, the same sort of thing is going on daily. Human trafficking is at a height in the world right now. At the top, you will find the best and nicest and often the most religious people in the community. Many come to the temple bringing sacrifices, but they have perverted the system. They have attempted to dictate to God how they will come to him. Aren't we wonderful people? We give to the church. We support the work of the church. We build parks. In Mexico, the politicians are corrupted by the vast sums of money that flows. Here in the United States, we have politicians getting amazingly rich. We're where their money come from? And why aren't they doing something to stop out all the terrible evil that's going on in our country? Micah says it in his day, and he told us it would be in the last days as well. We don't seem to be growing a better society. We seem to be growing a more evil, better hidden evil in our society. The rich were guilty of violence. They were liars. They were deceitful. You could not believe them. It is not a picture, is it not a picture today of our own nation? We cannot believe the news media today. We cannot believe the politicians, no matter what their party affiliation. It's a day when it is difficult to believe businessmen. It is difficult to believe those in military leadership. A contract is only as good as the person who wishes to obey it instead of finding a loophole in it. We are living in a nation today where most of us little folk are confused. We don't know whom to believe. This was the situation in Israel in Micah's day, and God did not approve of it. In fact, this is one of the things that brought the nation down and brought the judgment of God upon them. I want to say this very carefully, but clearly, because I love my country, and I hate to see what is happening to it. We are going down very fast. It didn't come suddenly. It has been coming for many years. To me, it seems even the genetics are falling apart. Autism in 1984 affected only one in 2,000 live births. It was rather rare. Asperger's syndrome was just being coming onto the scene. Few children were ADD and hyperactive. I rarely recommended drugs. Today, one in 36 children find themselves on the Asperger autism spectrum. Is it possible that even the genetics are falling apart? Suicide and drug abuse are on the rise because people find themselves lonely and feeling all alone. We have moved into an age of affluence and plenty, and we will really have left God out. And he is pretty much left out of our national affairs today. There has been no mention that I can find at this time that I am writing this that we need to turn to God in 
this emergency in which we find ourselves. The northern kingdom of Israel in Micah's day was in the same condition, and God brought a judgment upon them. They were warned what would happen if they didn't change their ways, and they still didn't change. They knew the Ninevites changed, and God spared them, yet God's chosen ignored his warnings, and we are following in the same footprints. Does that make any sense to you? God says, first of all, I'm going to start taking the things that you love, that you covet, away from you. The grand houses, the cars, the things you are, you say are yours. Tornadoes and hurricanes will increase. I will make you sick in the destruction of your things and ways, but I am not going to stop there. You're going to find that you will run short on many things before I am through judging you. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. You will no longer be able to enjoy all these things you have enjoyed, all these little goodies that you have coveted. Shortages and famines will come. Attempts to remove your wealth to a safe place will be fruitless because the enemy will get in. Gangs will rise and invent more ways to rob you of your goods. God intended to cut them down, but to cut them down gradually. That, of course, would give an opportunity for the people to turn to him or turn back. But the people of Israel were going through the externalities of religion. But internally, they were far from God. Every kind of flagrant sin was committed. And God cannot bless a people or a nation that engages in these things. The rules of Omri are kept and all the works of the house of Ahab. Instead of following the instructions of the Lord, they followed the stat statutes of the deceitful Omri and Ahab. They rejected the word of the Lord and walked in Omri's counsel instead. Now, in Micah's day, almost 200 years after Omri and Ahab, the effect and influence of their evil reigns are apparent. We see the same effect evident in our own day. The leadership of any nation, if that nation is to prosper under God, must be godly. He holds the leaders of our nation responsible for plunging the country into gross immorality through the examples which they have set. Micah presents God's philosophy of government. This is not being taught in any of our universities. This is part of our problem also. As a result, we're not really getting the facts, and our nation continues to decay and deteriorate. We will continue to do so unless we, a great revival should come to our land. Because we cannot hide from you. You have looked into my heart. You know everything about me. You see my deepest thoughts in every corner of my soul.
Polly, would you take our offering, please? You could take my cold with you as well. Thank you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we ask you to prepare our hearts for the coming week and the coming next Sunday communion. We ask you to watch over us and guide us and help us to be the people that we need to be in this community to serve you, to focus our life on, on not our life, but on what we need to do for you, on the life that we should have as, as Christian people living in this community, spreading the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ so that more may come to know salvation. Watch over us this week. Guide us, lead us, and direct us. Help us to be the people that we need to be. Keep your hand upon us and our comings and our goings. Be with all of those who have unspoken requests, who are praying for and, and for unsaved lost uh, loved ones, who are praying for illnesses and, and tragedies in their families. We ask you to be with them especially. We ask all these things in the name of our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.